So today we're going to start with a very old story about a gardener. And here we go. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God spoke light into being and separated it from the darkness. God created the heavens, the great expanse of the sky. God created the waters and the land. God spoke and the earth produced vegetation. God spoke and the lights which govern time and season appeared in the heavens. God spoke and the waters and land teemed with living creatures. And then God created the human. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. The Lord God formed the human of dust from the ground and breathed into their nostrils the breath of life and the human became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and there he put the human he had formed. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. The Lord God took the human and put them in the garden of Eden to serve it and take care of it. And Yahweh commanded the human, from every tree in the garden you may surely eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you will not eat, for in the day you eat of it you will surely die. Now, the serpent was more cunning than any living thing of the field that the Lord God had made. And it said to the woman, has God really said, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the fruit trees in the garden, but from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, God said, you shall not eat from it and you shall not touch it lest, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, you surely shall not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and was desirable for gaining wisdom. And she took from its fruit and she ate and she gave some to her husband with her, and he ate. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. So the human and his wife hid from the face of the Lord among the trees in the garden. Yahweh God called to the human and said, where are you? And he said, I heard your sound in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, who told you you were naked? I lost my place. <laughs> Oops. Who told you you were naked? There it is. Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you? You shall not eat from it. And the man said, well, the woman that you put with me gave to me from the tree and I ate. And Yahweh God said, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed. There will be enmity, hatred between you and the woman, between you and her offspring. And God said to Adam, because you have done this, the ground is cursed. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and in pain and by the sweat of your brow you shall eat of it till you return to the ground. Then the Lord God sent the human out of the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. God walked with the humans in the garden, this ancient story tells us. They were with God. 
And that all changed when the humans chose to trust the serpent's words over God's. They were deceived and they trespassed into the one place God said not to go. And as a result, evil, pain, and death entered into their existence. And they had to leave the garden where they walked with God. And ever since then, God has been working to restore what was broken. God wants to dwell with us. Our creator wants to be known by us. We see it in Israel's story first. God chose Abraham and his descendants and determined that he would dwell among them. You will be my people and I will be your God, he says. As early as Exodus 6, that's very early in the story. And he rescues them from slavery in Egypt so that he can bring them into a land where he will dwell among them. Um, As Israel is making their way through the wilderness to this land, God instructs Moses and the people to build him a tabernacle a place where he will dwell, or tabernacle, it can be a verb, among his people. And they do. They build him this tabernacle, and God does. When the tabernacle is complete, at the very end of Exodus, God enters it, we're told. Then, when Israel gets into the land that God had promised them, they eventually build him a temple. Where do they build it? In Jerusalem. It's also known as Zion. And God dwells there too, in that temple, we're told. But these earthly homes for God don't last, mostly because the people break the covenant. You see, it's the covenant that God makes with them and that they agree to that will ensure God's presence can stay among them. You will be my people and I will be your God is wholly dependent on whether or not they abide by the ways of love and faithfulness and justice that the covenant sets out. And they don't. Uh, That's the story. They don't live God's ways in the land as they were meant to. They are human after all. Um, And despite the prophets continually calling them back to God and God's ways, usually it's God speaking or it's, yeah, almost across the board through the prophets, it's God speaking through the prophets. So God's calling them back to himself to practice his ways and most of them, most of the time refuse to listen. But the grace we see in this story is that God refuses to give them up. He refuses to give up on his work of restoring what was broken. God wants to dwell with us. So at a particular time, in a particular place, God sent his son to tabernacle among us. That's the word John uses. Jesus was born. And not only did he show firsthand who God is and what God does, he conquered sin and death. The prophets pointed to this and to him long before he was born. And the gospels tell the story of his coming. Through them, we hear him, we see him, and we're given a glimpse of what's to come and an assurance that it will. This kingdom, the garden that once was, is coming. It's already on its way. God is restoring what has been broken, and someday it will be fully restored. And we will dwell with our maker face to face. Revelation 21 and the first five verses of Revelation 22 give us a picture of what this is going to be like. In the last scene of the seven final scenes in John's apocalyptic vision, we see a picture of the end. Our end, which is also, we'll learn, a beginning. Death and Hades, Satan and the beasts, and everything that has partnered with them 
have now lost their power over us and the earth. So that's what we've been seeing um, all the way through Revelation in these different iterations, these different visions. They have lost their power over us and the earth. God's wrath came. The judgments handed down from heaven have done their work and the destroyers of the earth have been destroyed. Uh, in the words of commentator Elizabeth Schusler Fiorenza, this final scene introduces us to a qualitatively new and different world. A liberated world. John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. This is at the beginning of Revelation 21, if you want to follow along in your Bibles. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. Uh, for the ancients, the sea represented turbulence and hostility and separation. Uh, so this is another commentator. Naturally then, there is no room for it in the new creation, the sea, uh, because of this turbulence and hostility it represents. I'm going to start reading in verse 2 now. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with humans. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And the one who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he also said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of water, of the water of life, without payment. God fulfills his promise. That's what we see here. God restores what was broken and dwells with his people. The one who is the beginning and the end will dwell among us and will continually make all things new. Death shall be no more. Grief shall be no more. Crying shall be no more. Pain shall be no more. Loss shall be no more. Mental illness shall be no more. Cancer shall be no more. Addictions and what has led to them shall be no more. Violence shall be no more. Abuse shall be no more. Starvation shall be no more. Poverty shall be no more. Injustice shall be no more. Our suffering will end. God will quench our thirst for life with him in the garden. God continues speaking, and he mentions us, the recipients of this book. The one overcoming will inherit all things, he says, and I will be their God, and they will be my child. But to the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, the murderers, and sexually immoral, and the sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, their portion, their inheritance, will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. That lake symbolizes where God is not, where there is nothing good. Now let's take a second and just remember who this book is written to. It's written to the church. It's written to us. And this prophetic exhortation is nothing new. We've seen it already. It's calling us again to stay true to God's ways and to reject the ways of the beast. To re resist becoming complicit in the sins of empire. Uh, remember, empires in this world seek and take power over people and land, and they create systems that maintain it, often at any cost. It is empire that draws us into this self-revolving nature, 
Um, it's coming from within us too, of course. But what do we hear as we, as we hear about these ones who are overcoming, who is, they, that's describing us? We hear this call to choose life. In other words, um, uh, that's, that's the echo from Deuteronomy. Choose life. Why? Why do we choose to do God's ways? Because that's the absolute best place to be with God in the garden. John goes on. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the last seven plagues came and spoke to me, saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And I'm going to be reading starting in verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God having the glory of God, its radiance, like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and the t- gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates, on the north, three gates, on the south, three gates, and on the west, three gates." And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke to me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Uh, 12,000 stadia is basically Steinbeck to Vancouver. Um, and this is a cube, so, so you can imagine um, that vast space. That's what 12,000 stadia would represent. The ancients, the people who were originally reading that would have no concept of how big that would be. Um, they were not able to travel those kinds of distances. Anyway, it's, le- it's length equal and width and height are equal. So that's the cube sense that we get. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. Uh, 144 cubits, Tim was helping me with this calculation. We figure it's 22 stories. So this wall that surrounds Jerusalem, this is a picture, obviously, is 22 stories high. That's the height of the RBC building in Winnipeg. Um, Anyway, the wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. And the streets of the city, the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Did you notice, so this is going back to kind of at the very beginning of 21, and then um, as this city is introduced uh, partway through, did you notice here and there that the holy city is descending from heaven. Did you notice that? Where is this holy city descending to? To the earth. And she's dressed as a bride. We've already heard that the marriage supper of the lamb is coming in chapter 19. We've been told that his bride has made herself ready, clothed herself with fine linen, bright and pure, made out of the righteous deeds of the saints. There's a clue to who this bride is, this holy city, this new Jerusalem. But there are clues to her identity from long before Revelation was written, long before Jesus even walked on the earth. In Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Hosea, God refers to himself as a fiancé or a husband. 
And who is his bride? His people. So when we read the description of this holy city, we see that this is not a place we go. It's who we are. Like we've seen throughout the whole book, this description symbolizes something. This pure, precious, beautiful, vast, majestic, holy city which comes down from heaven to earth whose gates are inscribed with the 12 tribes of Israel and whose foundations are inscribed with the names of the 12 apostles represents us, the people of God, those who have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. We are the bride of the lamb. We are this holy city. John goes on in verse 22. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. God will dwell among us or in us is what we read here. God will be accessible to all as as people enter this city. As people enter us. The nations and kings of the earth will find God in us. God will be our light The lamb will be our lamp and we will live God's ways and the whole world will respond in worship. Nothing unclean will ever enter us again. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. And many peoples shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. Someday, in this qualitatively new and different world, where God dwells among us fully, God's ways of love and justice, the ways of Jesus, uh, will define us and the world. I feel like one of those heavenly songs should show up here. Um, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. That's one of the songs that comes up. Here's another one. Hallelujah, for the Lord God, our God, the Almighty reigns. And here's another one. Great and amazing are your deeds. O Lord God, the Almighty, just and true are your ways. O King of the nations, who will not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your holy name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Uh, That last one's from Revelation 15, right in the middle of the book. But here, at the end of chapter 21, we don't get a song. We get one final picture, and it takes us all the way back to the beginning. This is starting in verse 1 of chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the city, of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the trees were for healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything cursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, 
and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. No longer will there be any curse. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. God will dwell with us, and we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I'm taking that from 1 John. And with God as our light, we will do what he set out for us to do in the beginning, I think. We will serve and take care of the earth, of God's creation. Listen to this uh, from Isaiah 61. This is talking about us as the people of God, being this city, being this bride of Christ. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastation of many generations. And this is the picture that I had um, as I was reading this and as I was tying that into uh, what we're seeing here in Revelation. God and the Lamb will be with us and our sleeves will, will be rolled up and our hands will be in the dirt and God and the Lamb will be planting and building alongside of us. This is, of course, one interpretation of Revelation 21 to 22.5. I find it a hopeful one for this beautiful, broken planet that we live on. I find it hopeful for all humanity, uh, every person. Um, this summer, I was speaking at Red Rock, and Red Rock Bible Camp, and... Um, I had an eye injury. Normally I run there every morning. I just go out the dirt road and then I take a left and I go down the highway a ways and then I turn around and come back. So I only got to do that one time because of my eye injury. Um, and I'm on my way back um, and it was a beautiful morning. It was still, um, the sun was shining. And I got to where, and if you've been to Red Rock, you'd be able to picture this. I got to where you would just almost be turning right to go down the road to Red Rock. So I'm on the highway. And uh, I just had this sense, like, of, of needing to stop and just be in that space, in that moment. Um, so I did. I stopped. I paused. I stood there. And... I don't know how long it was, maybe five minutes or something like that. I just stood there, and no vehicles drove on the road at that time. Uh, here's an aside, but it's important to the story. Um, I don't know if you know this about me. I have, like, um, tinnitus or tinnitus in my ears, really loud. Uh, so it's just a ringing in my ears constantly. Um, and it's becoming more prominent. I think it happens with age, and, and it's something I think I've inherited. Um, so anyway, I have this ringing in my ears all the time. I can hear it all the time. And I'm standing there, and it's silent, <laughs> so still, and I realize I can't hear my ringing because creation around me is making the same exact pitch. It's just swamp insects and frogs and stuff like that. Like literally, this is not anything spectacular in this one place. You're on a highway, there's some trees, there's some swamp. Um, it's nothing spectacular. And I'm standing there and I can't hear my ringing because creation is making the same exact sound. It's matching the pitch perfectly. And in that moment, I felt this overwhelming sense that God loves this land, loves it with his whole heart. 
And then in that moment, I was able to connect that to every child at camp. It doesn't matter what their background is. It doesn't matter what family they're part of. Every child at that camp. I think it's a moment that will stick with me my whole life. It shapes my theology. It adds to it. God loves this land. You think about the broken parts of our creation right now, and I'm talking the the desert spaces, the, the destroyed spaces that have been destroyed by human hands. We've seen it on the news. We're not seeing it in front of us um, in this space, but we can see it very easily through pictures um, of others and video. God loves this land, and he loves every person that dwells in it. Every corner of the world is seen and loved by God. And as I read scripture, As I look at the beginning and the end, this checks out. So what does this mean for us here and now? As we wait for this glorious day, this restoration that is like so deeply ingrained in us that we kind of like just know that it's coming and yet it's not here, it's not in front of us. And we long for it, but but we have no idea how and when and where and what that will look like. How does this impact our lives right now? I think we're meant to be hearing a call as God's people, first of all, to intentionally practice and work toward God's ways as we go about our daily lives. And this is no surprise, this has been the call of God's people all along, but how it plays out depends on our context, our individual contexts, whatever circles that we and spaces that we inhabit, but our context within our country and our province, like it depends on context and it also depends on what is needed. And that takes discernment, we've talked about that already. It takes paying attention We, God's people, are pointing to God. Um, We are so often how God works in the world. God works through us. So this means we align ourselves with God. We know, we, we get educated on what God's ways are. And then we keep our eyes open as we're making our way through our lives, through our days. Revelation continually calls us into this living God's value thing, right? And to resisting those things that go against God's kingdom values. It's calling us to be faithful, even when it's easier to accommodate to the values of empire, let's call it with with, uh, quotation marks. Even when it's easier to just turn a blind eye and go about our path and and, and just, just not even look. Revelation is saying, no, open your eyes. Move the world a little with goodness. I think we're being called to love what God loves and to reject those things that stand against him. We're called to be loyal to this faith, to firmly root ourselves in the truth of the gospel which includes that God is restoring the whole world somehow. And we're called to remember that Jesus has conquered sin and death and that we are the forgiven people. We're called to remember that what we do here matters. So how do we live into this call for the long haul? I don't have... (laughs) a list for you. Um, Again, I think contextually, we need to be thinking contextually, our own context, our our situation here, um, and what is needed. But 
living into this call, I think, and this is the word that came to me, um, looks like companionship. We're doing this together uh, as God's people, as people, right? We're, we're partnering together to do good in various ways uh, within our contexts. We are coming together to be reoriented um, as we worship, as we come around the word to remember over and over, this is who we are, this is what God's doing, this is what God has done. And then the other part of companionship, um, and this comes down to each one of us and how we um, relate to God. God is with us right now, right? The, the scriptures tell us this. We even experience it through the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. That's what I think Paul tells us. Um, somebody says that. Um, this is really about walking with Jesus. And we've talked about that metaphor before. Jesus is the one who changes us. Um, we can strive all we want, but in the end, it's, it's our turning uh, to him and our walking with him that shapes who we are. I think this is about being on a journey with him. First and foremost, offering ourselves to him in that. To close uh, for our final um, prayer, let's say, I'm going to invite you to pray the Lord's Prayer with me out loud. We've done this a few times throughout Revelation. This is about orienting ourselves to our maker and responding. Um, and then the song that John is going to play uh, during communion it's a, it's a spin-off, let's say, of this prayer. It's called Your Will Be Done, Lord. Um, and it's not only about this, but it's about this. About us as the church saying it together, but also each one of us individually saying it to the Lord. So I invite you to pray this with me, um, the Our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Um, Angel, can you poke your head out the back and invite the kids to come in? Welcome back, everybody. Here's your invitation to the table, friends. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. Many will come from east and west and from north and south and sit at the table in the kingdom of God. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites all to share in the feast that he's prepared. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at the table, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them and broke it and gave it to them and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. May it be true for us as well. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as they are delivered by the Apostle Paul. Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the death of Christ until he comes again. I invite you to repeat this after me. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. O oh Lord of all, we offer our praise and thanksgiving to you, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this juice in memory of your sacrifice for our sakes. Gracious God, we pray that you will send your Holy Spirit on these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and the blood of the new covenant. Through his body and blood, we are united to your son in his death and resurrection. We are made righteous through him and we are sanctified by your Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things under Christ and bring us to that heavenly feast where with all your saints, we will be gathered in glory everlasting through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church and the author of our salvation by him and with him and in him and the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. When we come to the table at Stonehouse, um, everyone files up through the center and we, um, and I will hand you a glass, a cup, and I will hand you the bread and you can take a piece of bread. And then when you are finished eating and drinking, usually people stand on the sides. Uh, you can put your cup back on the table or you can take it, to, take it to your seat. That's also perfectly acceptable. This is a table of grace and I invite you, sisters and brothers, to come to it.